You know, my wife Vonda, she she was she did a tour with someone else, and they were looking for us some songs that would flatter both of their voices. The, the one woman she was singing with was more of a pop singer, and Vonda's mm-hmm. more of kind of R and B based, and so. We went right to some of your mom's songs. And so she asked me to write out and work out what was going on with You Got a Friend, the piano part. Mm. And, it, and uh, I had always known your, your mom's skill, but those were clearly all choices. It wasn't just like every, every voicing, in, everything was intentional, which is quite different than people who just... Uh, kind of play along yeah. and then things happen and mm-hmm. it, it seemed like it was really deliberate uh, here's some of that in you a similar yeah. instinct that that thank you that you want to because it's it's more and you know like randy newman or mm-hmm. e- rufus or whoever it's more like it's a composition mm-hmm. it's not just like well i got these kind of chords and uh, yeah. I, i'm not going to pay much attention to them they're just a means for me to sing my song I was surprised right. when I asked Randy who his main like hero idol was. He said Carol King. She was the one. Oh really? He, he said started. Carol. Yeah. He well, said Fletcher before, Henderson. <laughs> <laughs> but when he started, he said, "I didn't even know you play a separate accompaniment to uh, the melody." You know, until I really heard Carol yeah. King. Yeah, well, and I, well, he loved the uh, uh, Fats Domino. He's yeah, like, I mean, but, that, but, but that was a different. But maybe the, in terms of voicings, like concentrating on voicings, which he is a master of. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and that aspect of Carol too. When when we interviewed her, she was playing a Rodgers and Hammerstein song and and saying, "See, the melody goes there, so you could have gone to this chord, but she, he goes here." You know, she delights in those interesting chord and voicings, and yeah. that's where she comes from. That's where yeah, I'd, I'd actually had it because I heard one of your songs. I, I got a on your new record, and I actually had a question. Oh yeah, <laughs> I wanted to find out if 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 you had it was in terms of a note choice in the melody. If if, okay. if you had thought about this uh, this other note. Which note? On which song? Uh, it's a, it's the ballad, the piano ballad. No one has time to love yeah. anymore. Yeah, so in the classic pop uh, thing, in my... to the piano. And then you went... Something. Yeah. So I was wondering if you had considered, because that... Is perhaps more original than what first occurred to me. <laughs> Never considered that. Because you got sets of nine, and yeah. so you go here, it'd be natural to go. I, I heard that minor change. Yeah, because it, that, that the way that I heard it, it would have been more traditionally the way the classic pop. So but, was but, it a good surprise when you heard the choice I made? It, it was like I, I I like I like it both ways. Yeah. I I was just wondering if you had made a choice like no I don't want to do that expected thing I want to go because that's more unusual to go because it almost like hitting the root note on the root chord is sometimes something you would avoid. Yeah. But. There's something really nice about it. So, you know. Yeah, when you say what's expected, you know, people who play in bands and they learn a lot of covers, when they're writing, they have to try to avoid rewriting what they know because they're trained in that. And for me, I'm not trained. Right. So I'm only reinventing the wheel every time, which is a long winded way sometimes when you could have shortcuts. Anyway, this is your interview. <laughs> I was wondering, did, did you have it's more pitch? interesting to me to talk about other things. That you knew that so well. Do you do a perfect pitch, or had you checked that up earlier? Well, I have perfect pitch, but you that do. doesn't have to do with that. Yeah, perfect no, pitch. No, I, I mean, I, I listened yesterday, and I went to the piano. I was going like, well, "Why am I hearing this note?" And I, it, it's because the da 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 is mm-hmm. a nine, and then and normally if you continue that same kind of phrasing, you also continue the nine into the next chord. You know, mm. it's like. It's like a. It must be a song that does that in historically. Yeah, da, but. Da, da, da. What, what's a 60s song that has that? Oh, no, 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 I'm yeah, something. Eight million. Because <laughs> <laughs> you've worked with so many great songwriters. If you do that, if you bring that to it, because you're a musician, obviously, a very serious musician, do you talk, you know, Randy, did you consider going here, you know? Um, in to terms most, of. Probably everybody but him. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> because his, uh, his hearing. And his awareness and understanding of music 
is so deep that it's it, it, it's just I mean the 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 furthest I would ever get to him is for example on the last record uh, he was writing writing some kind of really long form songs and it, it, at times it would get confusing to him so I would go over to his house and just start recording things and then tr try to edit things together just so he could hear the whole thing and then live with it and and so he occasionally he would ask my opinion like what do you prefer and then along with the what do you prefer you should have a why do you prefer it? <laughs> yeah <laughs> because otherwise it's just you know and then you start the discussion then he decides i mean he but uh most i would say most Singer songwriters that I work with, if there's one area that's that that needs the most work, it's in the the harmony of the song. Usually, I I get I seldom get involved with words because my theory is that uh, the most interesting thing about popular music, at least historically, it may not be true today because the singer songwriter thing has sort of lost a lot of steam. Mm -hmm. But it's people singing their own words in their own voice. That's that's what makes it at times much more interesting than jazz, mm -hmm. yeah. because you you get the person, the personality, what they're up to in their voice, and that's always what attracted me the most to it. And so I don't, unless I think some lyrics are very lazy or just or they just don't seem to sing well, I very seldom will comment on that. Uh, and melodically, also, it, it's uh, it would be rare. Like the most I would ever do is what I just did with you: is just say, "Oh, well, this is a possibility, but you did this." I and, and, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but if if you said no, that's my melody. Yeah. But if the chords were a problem, then I would say, "Okay, well, if we have this melody, maybe this chord would be nicer against it," because people use chords as placeholders mm -hmm. uh, often they just go to these really bland chords mm -hmm. they don't understand the way chords need to move for example usually if you have a song and the chords change every four beats all the way through the song you have a very boring song yeah you, this you, is what i love about your records it, it seems like you are using your level of interest in boredom at every moment to navigate the next decision. So y your records never, they never get boring and they always go to a really refreshing, unexpected scene change or a texture change. It, they're never predictable. Some, some, some may, some may not. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, yeah, but made even a lot, sonically, so, yeah. you know, not just in the, the textures, but sonically. I mean, I, it was really, really humbling <laughs> listening to, the, you know, the records that you've made again, and there's so many of them. I, I now have to. I'm going to watch Slam Dance again. Yeah, but you're, 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 <laughs> you tend to be remembered most for the ones that people like the most. You know, so it's, it's just so. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah I made I, I made a lot. So you've done many hopefully, great ones. Like you've done a, some, a, some of my very favorite records ever. Yeah, well, that's that's nice. I, mean, I appreciate the, the, it. But most Lobos records. Right yeah, but I mean, that's it's the talent. And you know, if it, it, it's not, it's a talent. It's, it's a talent, talent as well. Well, but if that were true, then every record I would make would be as good as that one, you know, or as powerful as that one. It's a, it's the timing, the time that you work with the artist, the amount of ideas in the room. It, you, everybody. I mean, the idea is always that you try your best, and and also also the idea, at least for me, has been. Just how do you feature, how do you put the artist talent up front and then back it up in the most compelling way and hopefully not the most boring way. Hopefully you can find a sound for, I mean, the highest level of something, if it's say someone like you, like a singer songwriter, is you find a sound that's theirs. Hmm. How do you and, know what they're... How do you, how do, you do that? Yeah. Well, it depends. If they're, an, uh, if they're a piano player, how do you base everything around that how, what kind, what's the texture of their voice if they're a quiet singer you don't have i mean you don't like obvious stuff big big yeah. crashing snare drums or ringing guitars or yeah you know so how do you find something that just sounds 
that has their body language. It's like the clothes they're wearing. Mm -hmm. They wear something that suits them, mm -hmm. you know. And I've made enormous amounts of mistakes because at times you all into trying to be more experimental because you just don't want to do the same generic stuff. Mm -hmm. But that at times you can make mistakes because of that. Seems so you try to get better at it. But you try to just bring a spirit of adventure and joy and, and concentration to things. Yeah. Come closer. Come closer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it always seemed to me that your your level of inspiration and being inspired matched the song. You know, it's so many of those records, I think of like the Kiko album with Los Lobos, which was them doing kind of newer kind of songs, more experimental, and the production matched it beautifully. Those sounds and feelings. It was. It, it was. That was a particular moment. I would say that was just more a moment in time because mm -hmm. I had had partner who you know Chad Blake and up until then he hadn't really distinguished himself he was always good he had been I'd worked with him for about four years or something like that at that point and uh, but our original goal was to get to the place where what we did together was be better than what we could do separately the first in my mind yeah i mean we we did some good work and and uh but he uh, there would be times we'd do records like a crowd of house record and chad wouldn't mix it or you know it was so even some of the the good ones weren't weren't seen as like a any kind of breakthrough but so that coincided with the idea that at the end of the night 80s music was seen as dead you know mm -hmm. rock people were saying is rock music dead and because uh, it got very boring so you had this thing and then Los Lobos came in and they were of a, f a frame of mind of like hell with it let's just you know it's all going away anyway so yeah, was, I was wondering what led to that yeah but a, they had start, they had done a few tracks before they came in with us a couple that made the record that were very good like that song Peace that was done before ah. so they had kind of started just they went to a nasty little studio at, at, in uh, I think uh, in East LA someplace and and they just started experimenting and stuff and so they did a few things and then I think they talked with someone you know Lenny Warnker and and the idea said why don't you guys just try something so the 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 first few days we the first track I thought we did okay and then after that all of a sudden it just just exploded oh, yeah? into something else and it was just fun it was really easy. It was, it was, it just felt like we all woke up. Yeah, it was like there was nothing to lose. and felt like there's Sergeant Pepper and something. But it was just, mm. it was just a confluence of events, you know, and mm -hmm. you don't get those very often because, uh, okay, for example, uh, Chad had just bought this pedal called a Sans Amp, which was. Uh, I still have one. Yeah, which was basically one of the first kind of distortion boxes that had enormous control so things could be dark slightly distorted this or that and it was designed for guitars okay so david hidago brought in um a demo that he had done at home that had congas on it and stuff and they were really dark and distorted and uh we were just saying well that's a cool sound and then chad had that pedal right there and then all of a sudden he's trying to use some of that on this conga part and then all of a sudden, everything just starts changing. It's like, whoa, well, huh. if you, if the congers are a little distorted, they sound more like a 40s record, but also there's no high end on them. So now the vocal sounds better. And now all this stuff, hey, you know, and then Chad was like, oh, I'm going to try this, put this on the bass drums. You know, it was just like that. It was wow. really playing around, but it was like, it, all of a sudden it seemed like there was all these possibilities. And so we dragged out everything we had that made a weird sound and and uh, just uh, took it. We just did one track at a time, like the track Kiko and the Lavender Moon. That was yeah. just a rough mix after, I think, a day and a half of recording. And we yeah. never could beat the mix. So the hell with the was that tape? I listened. Then? Was oh, it yeah, tape? everything was taped. Yeah, yeah so uh, it was the, the mix is a performance. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 hands-on faders. Well, it's I, I, no, I think that was... I think. I think it, digital, it was computer, uh, computer, I think at that faders. point. Yeah, I mean, the computer was running the board. Uh, yeah. yeah so I that, listened to that song, Kiko, you know, yeah. today, and 
it does sound like something from the 40s. It's cinematic and that keyboard sound. I don't even know what that is, but it's got a really interesting, you know, the, oh, the, the, the sax the, kind of thing. Well, the, the, it's a main, is it sax or is it kind of a main bed of, I thought it was a big keyboard, almost an organ sound, but very old sounding. The, the one that goes, dun, dun, the yeah, yeah, three blind yeah. mice. Yeah, that, that's a, I, it's right over there. It's, a, it's, it's called a Chamberlain. It's like a Mellotron. Oh, it's a Chamberlain. And it's a sax. So, okay, so that's a good example. Oh, I see. You're playing sax. So it's a, it's a sax sound. And a, From the Chamberlain. Yeah, but first of all, that was David's music. He had the idea of it being three blind mice and all the voicings were his. Ah. And I just did it because I thought that Steve Berlin was going to then play it. Ah. And so... But this is defines the spirit of the sessions because Steve Berlin's a producer in his own right. Mm -hmm. Ava Hidalgo's a producer in his own right. And so Steve came in and I played it to him and I said, okay, well, do you want to record the sex parts? And he said, no, no, that's cool. Yeah. And so it wasn't, I'm just saying it wasn't me. It was like this <laughs> thing that was kind of open and exciting and uh, and some very good musicians in the room who were you know so something that seemed like that which was just casually trying to fill up that space became something that we it's used such a distinctive rich sound too it gives it such a mood well it's the voicings <laughs> you know and that sound too is cool the yeah. Chamberlain is a yeah. great sounding thing yeah were yeah. they already moving into more experimental songwriting is that was part of the evolution uh, I, I'm not they had a, they had maybe three or four songs to my memory, and then they were just continuing to write. So I don't know if, if I don't remember it as this complete batch of songs. I think a lot were works in progress. And then after a few of them went, uh, started going kind of more extreme. Yeah, it was I'd inspired say. somewhat by the direction of the production and the arrangements. Well, just, the just the, the, the feeling in the room. Yeah, yeah. You know. So even when we got to some of Caesar's songs, which were more straight ahead, mm -hmm. Wicked Rain and stuff, we still tried to bring some of the least spookiness and stuff to it. And did he share that, you know, spirit of he, he was uh, He was open to it. He, I don't think he was naturally thrilled about it because he's a more <laughs> yeah, conventional more straight. But he was cool about it. You know, it was just like, okay, well, let's, let's just see. He liked, I think he was certainly happy with the tracks that of his songs, I, I don't think we took any of them and ruined them where he didn't like them or anything. <laughs> but I think he has he had different natural instincts. Yeah. But no. to, but to his credit, he 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 was really uh he was there and everybody was focused. Everybody's trying. So you're talking earlier about voices and how they come across, you know, on recordings and. It just seemed to me there's few better voices ever in recorded music than David Hildalgo's voice. That's right. Just so, do you feel that too? It's so oh, powerful yeah. and soulful, and it sounds so great on tracks. Yeah, and, and uh, what's interesting to me is particularly, I think, quite a bit on that record, but but that was that album was more more written up front. But some of the subsequent records we did, like particularly the Latin Playboys, but also. Uh, the the one the neighborhood? colossal head oh, you know colossal. the one right after yeah. David would get the lyrics from Louis he would have an idea in mind about what he wanted to sing and he would sing it once and that was it it's just and and I say well you want to do it again he's going like well is that cool and so well, probably yeah <laughs> you know let me listen again and what he looks for out of music as an as an instrumentalist and a singer and as I think one of the great guitar players I've ever greatest I've ever heard yeah, maybe. great accordion player too isn't he yeah but yeah. just inventive and and, yeah. and in the ground rooted like it is so soulful he sings way behind the beat and, mm -hmm. and but he looks for the the way it connects he doesn't want things to get mannered so if he's playing a guitar solo he'll want it to play it live if at all possible so that there's something that happens in the moment so if he sings he doesn't want to then think about it and re-sing and start getting in his own head. He'll fix something if it's bad, but I think if he sings and he doesn't like it, he'll probably just stop. And so, but it was really disorienting because I, I just have never take, been used it? to that. And I don't... But he would nail it, though. I mean, was there a need for another take sometimes? Well, sometimes if you haven't heard the song before, mm -hmm. now this is the first time you hear the song, you 
you're not sure that yeah. it's all represented there. You know, mm -hmm. is this, so this is the way you want it, right? <laughs> you know, and so if, if I know the song and someone steps up to a mic and just, it's happened a million times to me where they just sing it so well that you, you know, okay, that's it. Mm -hmm. But this sometimes didn't have that because I didn't know the song. Mm -hmm. And so, and I knew it was him just like kind of looking at the words and just singing, but it, it would be great. And then you just, sometimes it we wouldn't even have it loud in the mix because it was just his first pass, you know, so we would have adjusted the mic a little. So you wouldn't even hear it that well. And then, so then you turn it up and then you realize, okay. This is, this is it. Yeah. So, but it's his choice. Yeah. It wouldn't be mine. I, I, I would only speak up if I thought there was a problem with it. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about that in terms of how much labor goes into each track. Because uh, I know that for me, the spontaneity is crucial to keep that newness and freshness yeah. of not overly yeah. knowing. It. That's great for the editing stage and you know the final touches. But if I'm if I'm overly locked into a song, I can have this preconceived idea in my head of how yeah. it should go, and I don't get surprised in a good way. Yeah. So I'm wondering. I mean, everything sounds so detailed on your new record and all, all the parts. Right. Do you spend a really long time well, on that things? Well, that, that you took did. forever. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was like five seconds a day. And the synth thing, because I did it uh, a lot, just one note at a time, and there's no click, and, and so it was just insane. And then wow. I would have to get in. I was trying to make synthesizers sound not like a real instrument, but I, I'd been working a lot, or I had been working a lot on more traditional arranging strings, woodwinds, horns, and doing that on a few records. And I kind of wanted to bring that mindset to synthesizers and see how far I could go and see what could happen. And, and first of all, the rules change because the instruments you're using don't blend like a orchestra, so you just keep at it until you get things that kind of move the way you want. Mm -hmm. But So it was just a lot of experimentation. A lot of times I'd get 10 seconds five seconds in a day and then throw it all out the next day. It was, it was, I just did it in all my spare time. Whenever I had time, I would just go at it. And, and that, that's probably why I put it out because I'd feel like an idiot if I didn't put it out. You know, I, I know there's not a big demand for anything, but, uh, so, but the Love interesting it. thing to me is as a result of all that work, it kind of sounds like a theater organ more than mm -hmm. anything else. It like some elaborate, Mm -hmm. theater organ that's got all these weird pipes and stuff happening but that's some of it sounds authentically non-synthesizer in the same way that the chamberlain yeah you know sounded better than getting real saxophones and sometimes yeah. the glue on a synth is better than the it's just different pure yeah, instrument yeah and and i you know i just did whatever i whatever it took and and uh th th i used quite a bit of i didn't use my chamberlains, but I used a lot of the samples of them because the chamberlains are so uh, intense that I couldn't control it the amount that I needed to. Mm -hmm. And I needed a much bigger library. So there's some really good ones. So I did quite a bit of that. And I was just seeing what I could get. And it's all, um, for me, all this kind of thing is a is a process of getting deep into something and then it gives me something else I can apply to other mm -hmm. artists. Like I did one track that has a kind of similar concept on Rufus's new record. I, I, I played him a little and he had this song, this funny song that came up at the end. And he said, I said, well, I, I don't think we really can, that's cool, but I don't think we really have budget to go record it or whatever. And he was like, well, why don't you do one of your synth things on it and see what happens. So, yeah, so it's just trying to get skills. You know, mm -hmm. and, and being interested in mm -hmm. seeing if I can develop things. So. What was the sound that was like an opera singer that's really high, pure? You know, it, it's at the end of the record. There's a song that has this very oh, sounds, the melody. Yeah, yeah it sounds yeah. like a soprano. It's, it's a, yeah, well, it's a that it's trying to sound kind of like a theremin a little bit. Yeah, but it, that's just a mini moog. And, and I love the use of it. I thought, oh. It's I don't a, have to learn to sing that high. I could get a synth to do it. <laughs> well, it's it's a, yeah, except it those was all those like, things work best when surrounded by similar things. Mm -hmm. So if you put that stuff sometimes against natural instruments, it sounds great. But sometimes 
It sounds like, like a, oh, I'm sure you know this, if you use fake strings and make up an arrangement with other fake things and then have a vocal in there, it holds together. But if then you put those fake strings against the real track, they sound terrible. It's mm -hmm. just, they betray themselves. It, it's mm -hmm. open. So it's an mm. other world. You have to stay in their world. It's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. is. Yours doesn't sound warm. Some things sound so cold and brittle, but yours have a warmth. Are you adding a lot of effects to them as well? Some. And, and uh, yeah, I, I used to play since well, that's kind of how I got started. And so yeah. I just got back into them like that. I use that right there, Jupiter 8, quite ah. a bit. And uh, so I, but I didn't use the sounds that I originally programmed. But I just wasn't very happy with them. But hmm. but uh, so I use that in a mini Moog and and uh, just use whatever was around. But I'm attracted to things that sound that aren't real, like that real harsh, thin, yeah. plasticky mm -hmm. sound. I I don't care for it. So, but you just if you have a good instrument. So that's, have the to warmth is from the instrument, or yeah, you, well, the instrument and and how you program it. You can make those sound really buzzy and yeah, nasty. You're, you're you not know. adding other effects or sometimes the sound. Yeah. Sometimes a little, little delay or uh, a lot of what I tried to do, which is okay. For example, when the Hammond organ or organs first came out, people played them more like an instrument, so they wouldn't just turn it on and hold a chord and just have it sustain all the way through. No, they would push the volume up, down. They would try to make it work like like a violin would work or a horn. You know, no, you take a breath here. No, the you're now, you know, your volume is getting quieter as you're running out of breath or like, you know. Mm -hmm. And so they would work the instruments more like that. And so the further we got away from it, you know, through the 60s and 70s, all of a sudden the Hammond organ is something that people just turn up all the way and just hold down the chord and so it takes up all this tremendous amount of space it's like this thing that's just like hanging out in there and so that what I, I would spend a lot of time on that is building in where I couldn't do it as a performance I would then go in afterwards and put in volume ramps and like make it so that it functioned more as if it was some kind of instrument rather than just notes, you know, the mm -hmm. sustained notes. Mm -hmm. Imagine if a singer sang like that, where you oh. never had to take a breath, and <laughs> yeah. you just held the note exactly the same yeah. all the way through. It would be horrible. Yeah. So. Yeah, and that idea of space is not something everyone considers. A space in music is really so elemental and important. So many people have those long pads, just have a pad through every measure. Yeah, because it's like that. It, it doesn't occur to them often that, wait a minute, that might be cool, but if I if I make myself heard and then pull it back a little and then you know and, and so it, it's working better with everything, creating space. It can still sustain through, but it can do it in such a way where it doesn't. You don't have to just have it so quiet in the mix. You, you can mm -hmm. actually have it a little louder because it's not just taking up all the space. So mm -hmm. that's you know basic stuff. It's interesting you're talking how certain voices work with instruments. Is is that the quality, uh, the the frequency of the voice, or is it that you create space so the voice can be heard? And you said at one point if there's like a, you know too much bass or too much treble that that'll clash with the voice. Yeah, usually I, I haven't found ba bass as the problem. It's more instruments and the range of them and what they're doing. So I've worked with a. A lot of female singers that have soft voices. Yeah. So usually if it's going to be have aggression to it, it usually has to come from low a lower end place. So that they can you give them the high end, they can come that even if they're singing softly, if you need to, you can go compress it and make it sound more vital. But if you have a bunch of ringing guitars mm -hmm. or or sustainy things in the same range as their voice, they sound smaller and smaller and smaller. Ah. And there's, or you have to mix that stuff so far back that you shouldn't even have it in there. You know, it's yeah. So that's interesting. I listened to a "Blood Makes Noise" and Suzanne Vega. Yeah, that would track. be an example. That's all coming from the bottom. Yeah, and there's a lot going on, like that industrial yeah. drum sound and all. But yeah. she sings gentle in her style, and it, she yeah, comes but, across. It's it's really yeah. It, it was like a psychological song and it was dark mm -hmm. and so we could felt like we could get away with it being kind of clangy and it's 
it's a, it's like the chaos in someone's head, you know, what they're feeling in their head. So there was a reason for it. It wasn't just for fun. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. But then I think we doubled we doubled her voice through the strange PA system that Chad had. We did all these things we could just to make her project over it. Through know. a PA system. That's interesting. So Well, he had this it, not a regular PA system. Oh. He had this he went to India and bought this uh you know, if you go through India and you hear music in the street, it might be this weird mm -hmm. horn, mm -hmm. and it has this little thing attached to it that has delays on it and stuff, and they're playing music, and it's just this haunting, weird, mid-rangey sound. Mm. And so he went there, and he bought one, and we, so we tried it on some vocals and things, and it was it sounded pretty cool. I think that's what we did on that song with her. I'm probably wrong, but, <laughs> but it was things like that. Conceptually, yeah. it's fun. Yeah, yeah. and it, it's fun to do, but also it you look for things to make things cut through more. Yeah. Like if she, if we would have gone in that song for a very pure, beautiful sound, she would have sounded very unconvincing. Mm. Yeah. It needed to kind of bite. Yeah. I remember when I used to make demos in my London flat and I had all these cheap little synthesizers, the demos yeah. would sound amazing. My voice would sound huge. That's right. Exactly for the reason you're saying, because like things were with like things. So cheap instruments created an atmosphere and suggested something bigger than they actually yeah, and, took and those were the sonic days, space. And, and, and those were the days where there was always this assumption that any of your demo ideas were no good. Exactly. And that, You'd and redo really, it yeah. and ruin it. That's right. And Not I, you, but no, th no, that's what I, would happen. No, I, I, I heard so many records that were like that where I would say, why is this person signed? And then, huh. and then uh, you hear the demo, and they're fantastic. And, you, and you're and you like, go, why didn't you put that out? <laughs> well, why didn't you follow that concept at yeah. least? You know. Mm -hmm. But I think are you talking about '80s? Yes, I'm talking yeah, about '80s. Because that was that's when I started too. Yeah. And I, I'm grateful to the '80s because I never would have gotten started in any other era. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was horrible. It was yeah. it was so great to leave that behind because there was this way you had to work, which was really time consuming. Really stupid, expensive, super expensive. Like, like uh, okay. For example, this is the level of ignorance I brought into it. Like, so when I was doing the first crowded house record, it was like, okay, well, we've got to rent these drums from one of these guys, right? So it's like for seven days or six days, it's like five thousand dollars, which you could you could you could buy five drum kits. Yeah, right. But the whole idea is no, no. They come in, they tune the snare drum. They do all that. So, but then later you think, well, how can they tune the snare drum if they don't know what the song is? But those were such knuckleheaded days that it was just like this process. No, no, you got to get the big punchy thing. You got to get this. Trust me, this is like the way music goes. Mm -hmm. And it was. It was the way all the music sounded. But certain artists suffered terribly for it. And I also thought the artists that suffered terribly were the great 70s artists who tried to update into the 80s, and it sounded terrible. It was like the worst records of their career, mm. trying to embrace that mm -hmm. super chorusy, you know, artificial sound. And But a few bands, like the Pretenders or Talking Heads, they, they figured their way through it and were great, mm -hmm. but not that many. It was a tough, it was tough. Right, someone yeah. just said Talking Heads rode that way and kind of made it work, and then certainly the Pretenders. Yeah. Who well, you were you did an album with them, yes? The Pretenders? Yeah, but that that was not, not a shining that. achievement. <laughs> I love Chrissy Hine, but that was not that was that was when rock music truly was thought to be dead. It was end of the eighties. She wasn't very engaged, but it was still like this thing where you had to do things in a certain way. And we tried, but she didn't have a band. I couldn't get the musicians. We we put a lot of effort into it, but we didn't get to where I think we should have gotten. I think in the, I think at that period of time where you have a hundred great ideas that get blocked yeah. before you ever get to them. Yeah. You know, so if you didn't have those interruptions, yeah. there would be one great idea after another leading to an incredible outcome. Yeah. But in comes a team with all these, I love what you said, the knuckleheaded days. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I remember yeah. we got this mixer for the first Crowded House record who, who did, you know, he did a good job. I mean, there, there were so many 
issues that should have made that record unsuccessful. Like the tape machine that while he was mixing was actually running slow. And I didn't notice it because he had put so much effects on everything. He had five different reverbs on the snare drum. Wow. And I walked in and, and he's saying, I got five reverbs on the snare drum. I was like, cool. I, you know, that's the Dude. way it goes. That's cool. <laughs> 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 what do I know? You know? <laughs> but so that, but that was the day. It was like trying, projecting through that haze of all that sound, that clattery and the reverbs were nasty. There'd be these beautiful plates in the studio, but nobody would ever use them. You'd use these boxes that sounded really horrible. I mean, it, it made no sense, but it was the sound of that time. And now, of course, there's some bands are trying to sound like that, mm -hmm. which is really funny to me. So, that's not the era to go to. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Was, what you found primarily their mistake was like just spending way too much on trying to get a giant drum sound and that kind of thing, where they're spending much too much time on stuff that was not necessary. It, and the aesthetic was nasty. Mm. The, the 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 thing that people were going for was a nasty sound and, and not not musical. It was it was as if this was new music just the way it's going, which is great. They tried to get away from that the seventies thing, even though the seventies thing in general was far superior. They but here and there people would land on stuff, you know. Probably Bob Claremont was the best of the kind of more polished guys, like Avalon, Roxy Music. At that time, was like one of the great sounding records. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. And uh, but now it might sound a little soft, but still it, it it can hold up. So he he was musical with it, but everyone else it was just it was like, well, you got to use this, you got to use that, and it, you know, it's it's like country music now, where it sounds like you know basically hard rock music a lot. Mm -hmm. But if you go there, there's like a setting. Like I keep wondering, why are they using that much auto tune? on a sincere country song. But not only are they using it, but I heard there's a setting that they use and it's like you don't even check it. You just put it on. You're like you got that's that's the setting. It's like these rules that make people feel more comfortable that they're getting something successful. Uh huh. So you, so, so from that you learned what not to do. I mean you learned a lot of lessons what, what Yeah, I mean good. well I mean it was it was a bit of a shock but it was a huge relief to all of a sudden be going for different things like on the Kiko records the first one where we probably fully embraced going for something different and and just not you know but other bands too I think U2 started doing things that weren't that big stadium stuff you know like it was it started it started changing people started letting go of that but yeah uh, it's fear I'm sure a lot is fear based and just but like I say, I need to be grateful for that period because I wouldn't, if I would have tried to be a producer in the 70s, I would have had a much harder time. Mm. There, the people were really good. There, I mean, so many people were so good then. In the 80s, I, I started trying to be a producer because I would do sessions and I would think, oh, I could do better than this guy. You know, so... It's interesting you're saying, you know, we used to think you couldn't use your demos and especially with, with digital, when you can yeah. use stuff, you make it home as the founder. You don't have to start over. And yeah. for Tom Petty, that was huge because like so many people, trying to redo what you did at home, yeah. it's really hard and frustrating. It's, yeah, great we that they love it. it's great that people love that now. I mean, if you release those demos now, people, have, you know, they don't say, oh, this isn't done well enough. They love it. Well, it depends how good they are. Yeah, right. <laughs> it depends. You know, and, and uh, things opened up enough for... For me in early 90s where I got this cassette from David and Louie and it was just this music after Kiko, it was just this music they had. And I, and so I remember playing it for Chad and, I, and we just were saying, well, you we can't redo that. It was all done on a out-of-alignment four-track cassette. Yeah, right, four-track cassette. And But because it was out of alignment, the guitars were wobbling a little bit. Oh. But it had all this stuff going for it. And so that became the first Los Lo I mean, the first uh, Latin Playboys record. Why did those sound so good, those four track cassettes? Because that, that really has a great Well, sound. it depends. Compression? Who, 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 no, it, it <laughs> depends who's playing what. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, because after that, you know, after we did that, all these, a lot of people come out and go, like, oh, it's got to be this eight track cassette or four track cassette. But it just sounded like garbage because it would just be all distorted and not musical. They recorded so theirs well, the originals. No, not well. It's just that oh. David played everything, so it sounded great. 
you know. I got to get up in the attic and get those Porta Studio cassettes down and listen you, to them again. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I got my Porta. That's why I play Porta Studio. Yeah, but uh, that the uh, the one thing I do th- think though is I'm, I I don't like hearing the Beatles demos or all that stuff. Mm. I like hearing the final choice, even if you make a mistake. Mm-hmm. So, like in your case, yeah, you redid Bridge of Sighs, which was. You know, if you listen to the original, that's different than you going back and remixing that yeah. or releasing the demo of it. If you can, you made a choice then mm-hmm. that was cool with you. Now you make another choice to say, oh, I think I can give a more compelling version of the song I like. Mm-hmm. And you did. So that's what I'm interested in hearing. I'm, I'm in, interested in hearing the final decisions. Like when the Beatles were in the room with George Martin and if it was Jeff Emmerich or, or whoever it was. Somebody posted recently that if you listen to the versions right before the final versions, you will hear that the final version was better. And, and you'll see the notes, Jeff's notes. Oh. It'll say, Congo's too loud or, or something. Yeah. And, and you, can, you can hear the intelligence and rightness in the final but decision. Whatever, even if it was wrong decision, <laughs> it's still the, it worked. It's the collective decision, we're done. It's like a painting on the wall. It's done. You don't go back and then, like, give me that back. I'm going to now make the flowers a little more red or something. It's like the decision is a big thing. That's why I'm very disinterested in the remix Beatles stuff. And people say, oh, it has more clarity. It's like, that's not what they wanted in the room at that moment. Yeah. You're making, uh, 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 you know, it might be interesting to people to hear, but it's always interesting to to like get a multi-track and hear all the different parts mm-hmm. but it's the decision is the thing that's 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 why you make a record is to yeah. have I agree th- yeah and I yet it, it is fascinating for me to hear yeah. those demos you don't have any pleasure in hearing the early version of Strawberry Fields or any of those classics songs. well may, maybe a demo but but uh, not a remix not a remix that's a or different. reworking later you know. it's inspiring as a writer to hear them because People get intimidated by the finished product. You know, they yeah. compare somebody's finished work to the brand new little baby idea and think, "Oh, this will, this isn't good enough." Yeah. So sometimes it's inspiring to hear the beginning stages of something that became great and right. realize that greatness can come from these from vulnerable what? little moments where you're just yeah. trying things out. If you work, yeah. if you work at it, yeah. But it's, it's a, but it's all like I say to me. It's just. It's all decisions, and and uh, it seems like you know, like the people that have been at it more, like someone like Randy Newman or whatever, or Rufus Wainwright. Even once they make a decision, that's it. They're not. They're not. Uh, I mean, Randy still works on his lyrics after the album's out, but <laughs> but he makes his decisions, his musical decisions. Sometimes he'll go back and say, "Well, I never came up with a good ending for that song." Right. But it's not like he has one now, or. It, it, it's, it's just eternally dissatisfied he'll, with stuff. Well, well he'll, he might be dissatisfied, but very much believes that you make decisions and you own them, and that's how you get something great. If you don't do that, and you're constantly going like, oh, well, you know, I know I asked for this to have more of this on it or whatever, but now I think it's too much. It's like, no, you wanted that. <laughs> And you and everything now is based on your request, so that's what we have. You don't then tear it apart because then you've got to go through this complicated process of seeing how things now fit together again. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, I love decisions. Yeah, you, you have to make them, and and uh, and uh, it's it's uh, it's one of the questions that you face with now everybody being able to control everything mm-hmm. and every mix being completely available to be tweaked again. Mm -hmm. So say you're a mixer. You get the mix where you think it should be, where it reads the best. Now you get a call from someone that says, I love the mix. Could you just turn up the guitar a little bit here? Could you just turn this down a little there? Okay, so then you do it, and you often don't want to get involved with, okay, I did that. But now this is worse. Because then you have to explain why. Now you're opening this Pandora's box. So people would tend to just say, okay. And now 
in movies. Like now directors control the music. So they record the orchestra like a little section at a time, the horns separate from this and that. And then they, and so the, the director says, uh, I want more French horns now. And it's, they just give it to him. Where that guy shouldn't be allowed to say <laughs> that. The conductor yeah. of the orchestra who the made person. it work, yeah. it, first of all, it should have all been done together, but the way it works is the way it's powerful. Mm. Now, someone would say, oh, you're, that's splitting hairs, it's subtle, but why should you be allowed to just be making things worse? It's not, it's not good. It's like, it's like the... I try to encourage a kind of thinking that, mm. that doesn't allow as much for that kind of insecurity. Yeah. It so. can be neurotic, you know, artists can get very neurotic. Oh, yeah, and never. they lose their mind over nothing. Yeah, whereas, but, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but yeah, I mentioned no. I, was, I was in the studio when you were working with Randy on Laugh and Be Happy for yeah. the uh, Harps and the Angels album, and he wasn't neurotic at all. It didn't seem like anything uh, would even phase him. And also, it just, like Carol King, too, his songs are so well written that the instrument, I mean, the arrangement is built into the song. It was so clearly defined before you started recording. Yeah, yeah but when you're mixing, like, the degree of his ears... Yeah. You, so you mix, and and he comes in, and he's going like, okay, well, is that is the second clarinet is, is that loud enough? I mean, is, and then, you know, David, my, the engineer I work with, uh, he's actually my partner, but he'll say, well, I can turn that. I think I can get more out of it if you want. And then he'll do it, and usually Randall will say, no, no, I, it's right the way it was. It, it, I just. I was just wondering about this or that. Maybe I should have had him play more like this. But it's all, he's prepared to just, he hears it. He hears everything. Like the, like the degree to which he could hear is astounding. And, but he will accept things like performance. Or, you know. When you were working with him, did you, you know, hear the songs first and discuss you know, the approaches to the songs before going into the studio? De definitely. But where he, where... In his case, like my job is a, is a, it changes from artist to artist dramatically because it's more a matter of seeing where you can be helpful and where you should stay out of the way, where it's not like certainly harmonically, if he's doing a uh, orchestral arrangement or anything like that. I, I'll just, if he has my opinion, I'll give it, but I'm not going to say anything, I, essentially nothing. But I'm helpful, I think, with him in terms of rhythm, rhythm section, and maybe who to get. Yeah. And in the case of the last record, sometimes I spotted the rhythms. Like I was saying, oh, maybe the drums could come in, but maybe they should come in here, like just a little bit late, or that kind of thing. Uh, I mean, he's great too, with that, rhythm. That you really know drums. That he, he said, I don't know anything about drums. Well, he's he not did. interested in, in uh, rhythm section stuff, the sound of it the way that the sound affects the whole thing, you know. So if he heard a very modern drum kit against his music, I don't think it, he would process, oh, that's... I, he might think he doesn't like it very much, but but I think he would tend to think, oh, it's more the way the guy's playing rather than the sound also being part of what's creating the effect of it. So you're interpreting a little bit with artists when they say things... You're trying to figure out what they mean. Like if, if Randy was to say, I don't like the way he's playing that drum part, you might realize that he's talking about the sonics or something different. He wouldn't really even say that that much. And, yeah. and, and we got to the place pretty quickly where if you look at the music he loves, it tends to be, you know, well, it loves it. 20s, 30s, and 40s, or whatever. So you tend to use a drum kit that has more calfskin heads and right. that has more of a, t a tone that's a more kind of musical tone, not a 60s or 70s rock tone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. You had yeah. Pete Thomas playing that day that you worked with. Yeah. On some, Pretty yeah. And I met Matt Chamberlain remember, played he, on the last record. And he was using a, like a real old snare drum. I'm looking yeah, at Yeah, 20s, snare. probably 20s, so right? Ludwig or something. And he also was doing a perc and Laugh and Be Happy, a percussion part right in the middle of the drum part. You know, something yeah. you could have overdubbed. And Randy was playing live and it was all done live. That was yeah, I, really I don't, interesting. yeah, I don't remember that. But yeah, but yeah, he, I mean, and that, what, what Pete would do on Randy's stuff is he'd really practice up front he'd get the song and he'd figure out what he wanted to do so so randy would hear it like right on the first take and so different different people approached it differently so is that having 
Randy sing live and do his tracks uh, vocals. Is that what you normally do, or is that something Randy likes to do and always does? Oh, you it's you can't take it apart. With, you know, his piano him. playing and his singing with is. Him. Yeah, it's. Uh, but you don't do that with every artist where they sing live. Try to. Oh, you do? Uh, well, how is somebody supposed to play if they can't hear who's what's the singing going to be? Well, people uh, will scratch vocal, of course. And then yeah, but move. they should still sing. Oh, yeah, okay. And then if it's good, you yeah. can keep it. But if you just throw away that idea, you're taking away the possibility of one of the greatest moments you can ever get. <laughs> Which is someone singing something beautifully and everyone backing them up. Yeah, yeah. there's a mo- there's the, that, there's nothing better than that. There's yeah. the potential for uh, amazingness singing it with the band. There's this other element of excitement in the room when you're playing with other people at the same time and singing yeah. it with other people. Well, what is a band? What's their job? It's not. It's to create the mood for the singer. That's the job of the music. Back up the singer. So a drummer, if he's good, if he hears someone singing a song, he's going to scale his playing intensity-wise, groove-wise, everything to flatter that person. So if you have a white singer, you know, that, that has a little bit of blues in him, you don't play like some deep blues part. You play white blues, it has a <laughs> white song that has a little blues in it. You know, you back them up in a way that flatters them. You don't want them to sound like like they're not soulful or something. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, you know, you, you got to go with that person's feeling. And that person, you, it's, it's, you can't describe it to somebody. It doesn't matter how experienced somebody is. But, but really the thing that can happen is when you just get that take that, mm-hmm. that you, everyone knows, okay, well, that's just, you can't touch it. Are you doing yeah. that in here? Are you tracking in this room? Yeah, we yeah we can get like five people in here going. Do Sometimes you have drums in here or drums in that. Oh right, there. you got them in the ass. And uh, so normally, like well, we did Randy's record here. He was at the piano. Oh. We had a guitarist over there, bass uh, upright bass over here, drums in there, and. Uh, he uses upright bass a lot uh, with him. Why with him, the, yeah, because that's that a, that's the instrument. That sounds best with what he does. Yeah, yeah. Upright bass has a kind of greater depth, and also it doesn't have the the sustain thing. Oh. So it's more acoustic. You know, it's just more where his music lives. His were never scratch vocals. Those those were his final vocals when you would record it, right? Or, or no? yeah, yeah. I would think. sometimes we, sometimes there'd be edits between takes. You know that that would be as far as we go, but yeah, particularly some sometimes in the past we used a click track or a little bit, mm. but he wouldn't hear it. But like on the last record, we didn't use any of it; we just played. He was always joking that he kept writing shuffles. He said, "No yeah. one likes shuffles. No one wants them." <laughs> and I just me. keep doing them. You like shuffles? Oh, I love shuffles. Oh, I thought yeah. you were part of the anti-shuffle thing. <laughs> no, no, it just depends on what kind. It sounds great. I mean, he always it's a swing hear. rhythm. Yeah, 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 which is. Which is you know, fantastic. So, do you like tinkering in here on your own? Do you engineer yourself when you come in and well, spare time working on things? Well, n- now, uh, it, it, out of necessity, because things have changed so much, it's not. Uh, I d- I often develop full arrangements for someone before we record. Sometimes, for the reason that if you do that, then you actually a record company will pay for it. Because record companies, if you just give them a demo with a guitar and a vocal, it's not going to work out for you. Unless you have, what, 800 million streams or something. I don't even know what happens anymore. But people, if you want to have, to convince people that something is worth it, you kind of have to present them with the record in this weird way. Mm -hmm. So I do that. And also I use, I do a lot, I'm like I did on the synth record and now I'm doing some stuff with rhythm now that, that interests me where I'm, I'm just trying to develop some new techniques that I can now bring into future stuff with with what instrument are you doing the rhythm well um, I don't know if you heard that monkey tree thing mm-hmm. but but so I, I've got a, this different way like some of the drums were these recordings that were originally done for um, 
an instrument called the Optagon. So it's yeah. just all these yeah, sessions, 70 sessions, right? So I got the actual tapes of that, not scratchy tapes, the actual sessions. So I, well, I used some of that with my engineer. He did the programming then on the monkey tree stuff. But now I've figured out a way to take some of that stuff and treat it in such a way that it's very different. Mm -hmm. And it's, and if I do it correctly, it sounds like a surreal version in between live and program music. It sounds like something in the middle. Mm. And it in interests me. I, I'm not, so I've just been working on a bunch of that. Uh, and I, I'm working on a record with a guy that we're, we're using some of that. And, and, uh, We'll see where it leads, you know. I, so it's always that for me. It's like, okay, now what can I be developing? It seems like, uh, you know, particularly guitar music or whatever is so worn out now that it seems important to try to make, come up with something. You know, not just do this, the regular thing, unless it's an artist that's super established that people just, like if it was... I don't know what Pink Floyd or something. You you would just okay, that would be just, a great record. You producing? No, Pink I don't. Floyd. I, they don't even exist. <laughs> but uh, cool but any, but sometimes established people you don't reinvent the wheel because they or like in the case of Randy Newman he wouldn't. I don't think he's would be thrilled about the idea of you distorting his orchestra or something. I mean, he would hate it. It's like well, no, that's my art, you know. So mm. I'm not interested in the studio as a kind of way to create new stuff i i want to create new songs and new arrangements and new ideas that's what i i'm about you know mm -hmm. so you know but uh so you do come in and tinker every day i, yeah. I work every day on, on something and do you feel pressure to come up with something great or no yeah no. i i i guess in what we were sent you had a quote i just want to keep inventing and creating something new even if it's terrible and I thought well that's very humbling I, I don't think I want to wake up in the morning and try anything and feel like I'm failing at it but it's if you try something you different yeah it's often terrible <laughs> you know you follow it. it it's a it's a following process where yeah. you start with something you mess around with it okay well what if I tune this way down okay that's kind of cool okay what if I do this okay what if I edit this you know and then at the end, it could just be like, oh, well, that's not very good, is it? <laughs> you know? But it was a nice way to spend a day. Well, even yeah. if it's not, yeah. even if it's a painful way to spend a day, it's still, it's like the... the uh, Exploration. It's exploration, it's and it's, yeah, and it's the privilege of having a life in music, which is, uh, I didn't always feel that, you know, when I was under really pressurized situations or dealing with unreasonable people, but... It is. It's a deep, you know, privilege. How many people get to do that? Yeah, to be in music all the time. Yeah, just spend your day working on music. And but Randy mentioned that, too, that it's important not to let the critic get bigger than the creator while you're creating music and not to get in the way of it. To put, put it down, you know, make something happen. Yeah. If you get to it, that's not good enough, and you get in that mind, you just get in the way of the whole thing. Yeah, he's, for the level of his talent, he's really a humble guy. You know, because he he'll be very self deprecating. He'll think he misses stuff, and he's and overly humble. He compares himself to yeah. Billy Joel constantly. He has, he has more hits than I do. Yeah, but he also knows how great he is at the same time. It's both. I, I think both is going on with him. Yeah. So uh, he's but, not comfortable singing his own praises. Obviously. No, but he he one of the reasons he doesn't love working on music is because it's so hard, and so he'll take a little break and then he'll say, well, I'm not really enjoying this break and he'll get back to work. Is that right? But, but while he's doing it, because for him, his standard, I think, is what, what he's shooting for is kind of impossibly high. Hmm. And so where he errs, I think he, he, he's, he gets down on himself. Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure you do. I, I certainly do. I, if I hear music on the wrong day, I, I can hear anything I've done that you might like. And I can hear it on a certain day and just think it's completely terrible. And why did I do that? And yeah, yeah. it's it, it's almost like when you cook a meal, it's not up to you to decide whether you've cooked a good meal because you were there along with putting the spices in, and it's not a fresh 
not fresh to you. Someone else can go, this is, this tastes great. Yeah. You know, it's good to move on and, and well, not it, go back. But you should have the moment before you serve it where you think it tastes great. Yeah. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. And, and then, then, and then trust. And that's another thing I try to tell people. It's like, okay, we're done here. Everybody loves this. We've got to trust the moment that you think something is great. And sometimes you're, if it's, you're in the wrong frame of mind, you can make a mistake early on. But if you've really worked on something and you hear it and it's great, it's what you like, don't worry about it later. Trust that you got it to where it needs to go because it's not going to get better than that. Yeah. In my experience, it's yeah. never gotten better. That's, so. a beautiful, that's a beautiful sentiment. And, and I just feel lucky to feel childlike enough with music where I feel like a beginner every day. Yeah. I feel like, oh, I, I have not even scratched the surface of what's, what I'm going to do. That, yeah. that feeling of like I'm just getting started is a privilege to feel that way. Yeah, but, but it, comes, it comes with me. It's like, at the same time, we always feel like, boy, I should just be a lot better. <laughs> I, I could have worked a lot harder. I should know a lot more. You, know, I, you sound like yeah. Randy sometimes. He can well, really be down on himself, Randy. Once he joked to me, because interesting what you said about his high standards, because uh, he was saying, you know, one thing I've learned in this business, if you want to stay, you know, happy, lower your standards. Yeah, well, that's his... <laughs> that's a that's, that's yeah. good with life. Yeah. Of course, he's joking. <laughs> his standards, as you know, are very high. But, but, but that, would be, that, that would be a joke he would tell after you hear a track, you cut a track, and then you come in and listen. He says, okay, well, let's just lower our standards. You know? <laughs> and, and it t sort of takes, uh, it takes some pressure off it. Because it makes a joke out of something, but there's truth in it. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, you're listening, going like, "Okay, we're not lowering our standards, right?" right. And so if you say to him, "No, I think this is really good," listen again. You, or you say, "You know, you're right. We, let's go try this again." And, you know. But when it comes to mixing his stuff, it seems pretty pretty clear what you're going to do. There's not a lot of choices. I mean, it seems pretty predetermined. Or is that uh, not, no, no, no. It, 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 like uh, particularly his. His new record, well, first of all, because it's on um, Pro Tools, there's so many tracks, like full orchestra tracks, sometimes jazz band, sometimes with rhythm section. So to get it, the difficulty is you have to make the decisions, what's up front, what's behind. But also, and this is mostly David Boucher, the guy who makes this stuff, is, is uh, you have to make everything sound like it's happening at the same time, coming from the same room. And uh, if, say, the orchestra is feeling the rhythm a little bit differently than the horns were, the, you, the jazz band horns, you've got to accommodate that so that it's musical, which is really tough. Because hmm. it's not just a matter of lining things up to a grid. There is no grid. Mm -hmm. it's, it's understanding the feeling and the phrasing and how, if you, okay, if I just move this just a little bit this way, it'll all sound more cohesive. It's not... It's not, but you have to, it's still, each thing has to swing and move organically. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, uh, it's not easy. <laughs> Does he feel that way about the mixes too? Or is that mainly you that's, that's balancing on bringing that? Well, Randy, he, he just wants to hear it as music and he would pick it out if it's, if it, if and it is he active in the mixes with you or do you mix? Well, David mixes. Okay. And then, uh, I, at this point he's my, I co-produce records with him. So my trust in him at this point. I've had two partners, him and Chad Blake. And David I've worked with maybe 15, 16 years. And uh, so he mixes and then I come in and I try to listen like uh, as if I don't know the difference between a piano and an accordion or something. I, I just try to listen and emotionally. Mm -hmm. And then if I notice something, I'll mention it to him and then usually he's already addressed it. But if I'll make some tweaks. I try to be minimal, and then when we have it where we think it's working, then Randy will come by and listen to it, and uh, and then he'll he'll listen three or four times. He'll usually have something to say, like, "Could you? Could this lead a little more? Could this happen? Could that happen?" And we try it. Sometimes he says, "No, it was better before," and then other times he'll say, "Yes, that's that's what I'd like," but he'll just own his choices, which is really. Really nice. It, it it takes some of like I can feel like this undue amount of pressure and responsibility because mm -hmm. if someone's 
maybe less experienced and I hear that they are in my mind clearly ruining it, I, I have to speak up in a way that's not confrontational, but I, it means me taking responsibility and saying, I really think for these five reasons that this, we were better before. That, mm -hmm. you know, if you love it like this, it's your record, that's fine. But I have to tell you from my perspective, I think this is not as good. You know, so that that's part as that's heavy important. as I get. I mean, they do want that. They, they, they some, need you to do no, that, not, right? Some no. don't. <laughs> no. I think everybody wants to feel like their ideas are awesome, particularly if they're starting out. Like, you want the support. And, and, and uh, it's a male, female, it really doesn't make any difference. It, it's, mm. uh, everyone needs to be listened to and respected. And you have to respectfully uh, make it about the music. You don't you ever take with? credit, and you just that's you just make it yeah. musically. This is what I think. It's your choice, your record. But are you yeah. working with a lot of young artists? Uh, here and there, yeah. yeah. Like every year, I seem to work with maybe one or two. Mm -hmm. Just it just depends what kind of comes my way. It's kind of random these days. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, I'm involved with projects that sort of seem to be taking longer and longer. You know, Randy's last record was about a year and a half. Wow. Rufus's was close to a year and a half. Not not constant, but just he came and went a lot and we were just working on it. And I'm doing this record now with this guy from Belgium that's by the time we're done, we're sending stuff back and forth. By the time we're done it will be over a year. So mm. it seems like that's the way things are going. So You know, Randy is such a master musician. I asked him, Why do you need a producer? You could produce yourself, right? And he goes, You know, you need someone else to say yeah, that's good, or do that again. You need that other person. Well, you can't make those decisions always on your own. By well, you can. But maybe not as well. Huh? Well, I, I think, uh, all right, Louise, you, you, obviously you can produce yourself. Like every Everyone that knows music can make decisions. It's just, in Randy's case, he was always had producers, unlike young artists that just make music on their own. Mm -hmm. And so he appreciates the foil and... I think if he feels that the person is backing him up and understands what he's doing and is just like, it's almost like the questioning voice. So, and if he's singing and playing, he doesn't really want to have to worry about the drums, for example. If he sees at the end of the day that you've contributed something, made it move easier for him, help the decision process flow, it's just what he's raised with. So, so to him, like, I mean, in a normal, I've, I think I've even said it, when I work with anybody, I say, well, if you want to be a co-producer, go ahead, you know, but he's like, well, why would I want to be that? Yeah. Like what sort of Prince started it, I think, where he said producers are useless. Yeah. And, and then everybody wanted to be a producer, but to him, that's not some great title to aspire to. He, he has no desire to have that title. It's like a, workman job you know so well I, I never really cared about it much but it, it became a thing where there are such a lower proportion of women who call themselves engineers and producers that's and, right and i felt okay i'm coming up with a lot of ideas and arrangements and how this goes and i'm fine taking a back seat with it yeah i thought you know i gotta own the space just to claim it, own it. Well, to be honest, in 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 the nineties, when I started working with more and more female artists, mm -hmm. I would almost insist on it. And and th th this isn't the reason. It's not like yeah. I'm some great guy or something. But I, I would I would say, what I see is that if there's a producer's name and it's a male and you're the female artist, if you're not on there as a co-producer, what happens is it's like. In those days, particularly, it'd be like, well, thank God Mitchell Froome was there to do, you know, like, it would be like, oh, thank God so-and-so was there. It's not the old days. It's the, it's the today. It's still but, a little... But, yeah, but it may still way. be prevalent. That's, yeah. I, I always offer it because I say, you're the one. You have to go out and sell it. The more you are involved in a lot of these decisions, and even if they're not involved with as many, it's, a, it's part of... Now, it's part of claiming it. It's part of saying... I can go out and this is seen as me and my music. 
I'm yeah. not the pers- manipulated person behind the scenes. So, yeah, I agree completely with it. Randy, yeah. but he, he's like a man, white man from the 60s. And so it's not even... Yeah. It's a different situation. And, and because of yeah. his obvious musical gifts and who he is, and it, nobody would ever say, thank God this person is controlling Randy Newman. You know, it's like, well, it's, I, that's I, I not get possible. It. And yeah. Chrissy Hines said, I don't want to be a producer. Why would I want to be a producer? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she wants to be the the artist and work with the producer. Yeah, but yeah. Well, certainly. she likes the she likes the the service of the producer, like someone <laughs> caring of it and like taking care of stuff. And she can go in and she could like be the rock star and be the singer and be awesome. And you know, I, but, I get but, that. That but, makes but sense. She's so intense and and she's a rock singer too that nobody would disparage her. Like yeah. So she it's not her worry. But I I I mean I work when I worked with Sheryl Crow, like, uh, I worked some on her second record. And her first record was at Tuesday Night Music Club. All people were saying was, well, who is Sheryl Crow? Is she even talented? Like, we don't know. She's got all these musicians yeah. around her. And we don't, you know, maybe her next record will know. But she was so disparaged in terms of not giving any respect. Like, people thought, oh, she's just a singer. It's like all these dudes, they wrote all the songs. And, and, she was not getting along with some of them because they were feeling like that enough credit. So they were some of them were saying bad stuff about her, and it, so it was clear on that next record that I got brought in at the end, and I just said to her, "Call me anything you want, but, but give me any credit you want, because she she had produced most of the record. You've got to be the producer." I love know. the Globe Sessions record yeah. she did. Yeah, so she, I mean, she took it on. But it, if if my name was featured too prominently, it would have been more of the same. Mm-hmm. And I, and what do I care? You know, it's, it's like if I'm, as long as I'm not disrespected or something, uh, it w- it doesn't make any difference to me. You well, know, I, I'm well, not. That's that's surprising because yeah. someone who's achieved what you have and the amount of records you've produced on your own, many producers would not want to have a co-production credit. On anything. Well, I mean, I, I insisted that at some point Chad was my co-producer, and I insisted as soon as I saw that people were asking for the Chad and people were asking for David, and that they were taking a bigger, bigger role. It's like, well, you're a co-producer, and then anyone else, you know, if it's the artist, you say if you want, if you want it, if it helps, because the idea is you're trying to help the cause of the record. You want the record to succeed, which means the artist has to be in the best frame of mind to promote their record and the, and which means they can't be disparaged or being seen as like part of this oh well they went under the wings of this or that it's like no 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 i i brought in my music i i mm-hmm. was there i didn't just show up and sing and then go go away and play golf or something you know it's so it's important and it, and it makes no difference it makes no difference to the amount of credit i get it makes no difference to anything so it's a silly argument unfortunately the whole thing started because it's like you know to me it's like saying well do you want to be co-janitor on the record it's like <laughs> you know what i mean it, it why do people think that if if there's a producer that that person is controlling the situation it, that's not your job your job you know if, if you're if people pick you out because they like they see your name on records they like that's wonderful but that doesn't mean you're like some Svengali you know I think often we do have that impression even uh, especially when it's a female artist it's easier to believe the man is in charge but even with the Beatles I it, I find that George Martin often gets a lot of the credit for, for their ideas I mean John Lennon even said that we were producing and they were some he was getting yeah. what we wanted well, I, I don't completely agree with that no? uh, because if, if you listen to the he was one of the most serious arrangers ever. And if you listen to even the guitar arrangements, and there was a mind behind it that had to do with a way of listening to music. And I think it's likely that his hearing and the way that he reacted to instruments was hugely influential on him. Now, I know Paul wrote you know, trumpet lines and... You know, that, With him, oh, they did it together. Well, he sang it, and they, yeah. that basically was it. And they, and they they contributed. I mean, they're hugely talented, but I, but I don't. I wouldn't diminish him. 
Right. That's my instinct would be. Yeah, it was a great. No, because no, it was too good. No, the, the, the arrangements no, were too no, solid. Those vocal what, arrangements, like on because that he did, those are. Yeah, he, he would help with that, but wonderful. but just even like the, if it's two guitars, what each thing is playing, hmm. and and like a way of listening. I'm sure he was like, well, you, you know, you're kind of clashing here. You know what? What do we do doing? You know, like just music, music, yeah. musicality, and then all of his arrangements were beautiful in there. They're they're just so f kind of flawless mm. that it it makes you think and then him cutting up tape and go playing stuff backwards like like the way he helped open things up for him i wouldn't call him the sixth beetle but I, I i would say he's he's as good a producer as there ever was there's some thought that jeff emmerich didn't get enough credit that he was actually cutting the tape and doing a lot of the stuff that yeah i don't that, think that that you know i i hate to say it but i my favorite engineer with the beatles was norman smith is that right? He did uh, Rubber Soul, which was my favorite sounding record. I, I, I thought he was tremendous. You know, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I, the only reason he left was because he wanted to be a producer. And, huh. and I don't think uh, George Martin wanted a co-producer. <laughs> so he went off and did, uh, so I think, what was it Pink Floyd? He did some psychedelic bands and, and he had his own career. But he was, he was a, I think technically he was the superior engineer. Hmm. It's interesting. You say you like the decision, the original decision, and as as everyone knows, and certainly you know, most of those early Beatles albums, most of them were, were mono. Yeah, they didn't care about the stereo as well. So, to you, do do do, do you like the mono? And you think mono is much better, isn't it? Yeah, because it's it's the ch it's the choice. You, you know, they mixed it in mono, so they got it the way they s s sounded. I mean, I got to work with Paul McCartney once. Yeah, and he did flowers songs. in the dirt, and so he was. I didn't. I just was asking him about this. You know, he, he those guys weren't even there for the stereo mix, and yeah. it was just sort of like this thing that happened. But it wasn't really thought out. Yeah, he said, he said "I remember the first time I was at a party and I was standing in front of a speaker and they were playing our record, and I was like, that's only half the band.'" <laughs> and then he said, "I walked across the room and I go, oh, there's the other half.'" So I didn't give a shit. Right. It was like he wasn't upset about it. Yeah, only hearing half the mix. Yeah, now some people, of course, because they love the music and they love the effect that has, they like it like that. But that's if you listen to the mono thing, it's so much stronger. It, it, that's the decisions there. They didn't take on the, the science of how to mix in stereo. They, they were just separating things out, I think, so that they could be combined into mono in a certain way or... Is that why you, you, you like the mono mixes better, or is there something about the nature of mono itself that has a different quality yeah. than yeah, sometimes things up? N I, I, those are choices that sometimes on certain music, it seems like if I'm working on it, it's, it tends to the end. Like David will say, well, this sounds better in mono. Yeah, you do that? And sometimes. Huh. If it's not quite holding together, sometimes it just works in a certain way in mono. It's It sounds better. And so... A lot of times, it's almost like the source of the rhythm track is kind of in the middle, like it, the way it functions together. And if you spread it out rhythmically, it just gets kind of confusing. But if it's together, it creates this picture. It's all different. Mm -hmm. But th in those days, mono is what you had, and that's right. they did everything. Every decision about even what people were playing was with the idea that it was mono. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. You're saying that it it's the decision making in the artistry was within that context, and if you change the context, you can't really say that what you're hearing was the decision of the people making the music. It changes everything. It's like you have the furniture in a room, and then you put it in a different room. It's it's not the same. The yeah. So what do you do if you have, let's say, John Lennon was alive? I'm not going to talk about Paul because he's alive. So <laughs> say John Lennon was alive, and he's say he's 60 or 70 years old, and he's and he's saying. I want it, you know, I much prefer these things remastered, spread out in stereo. It's like, sorry, uh, that's nice that you may want that. But the young you that was in that room might feel differently. And that's the guy that we're interested in. That's the guy that wrote the song, just sang it, and was there with everyone. So, I mean, they were experimental. They always would have wanted more stuff and like more opportunities but it's the limitations sometimes where greatness is and that was 
this, their skill, they had the skill of making these incredible mono recordings. They're more exciting. There's just no question. They're just yeah, better. Yeah. And talk about limitations recording on like Sgt. Pepper on four tracks. I mean, that's quite a limitation, isn't it? Yeah, but this, with the sound they had and what they had available to them, all, all those things, it was all developed skills. And, and so, I mean, you know, if I work, like every time I work with David Hidalgo, he'd bring in a couple guitars. He has like probably 500 guitars. I don't even know. But he'd bring in a Mexican Stratocaster or he'd bring in like some Epiphone he just bought. He, he would limit it because you don't want endless possibilities all the time. So a lot of times you limit yourself to that this is this and let's see how much we can get out of this rather than, okay, well, let's, let's use everything all yeah. the time, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. You mentioned you know, working with Paul McCartney. He's done some pretty great albums. What was that like, you know, working with Paul McCartney of all people? Well, I, I, I had a limited, it was limited. There were some things, I'm almost glad that I, that I hadn't listened to the Beatles a lot recently when I, you know, the 80s were a time where people were thinking, oh, Paul's kind of lost it. And, you know, but when I grew up, the Beatles sort of were everything. Yeah. And, uh, and I love the records, but the most intimidating thing for me, because he's also did some great productions, was the manager said, well, here's his number, call him up. And that, it just made me pause. You know, I was, I was just starting producing. I'd produced maybe two or three years. Here's Paul years. McCartney's number, call him up. Yeah, <laughs> call him up, and he, he wants to talk to you about it. And So just talking to him, he was very nice, and I, I found him very nice, but it was intimidating me suggesting to him I'm producing you you know just the whole context of it was odd you know but he was just like loose you know and uh, so we, we, it was not anything where I uh, I was brought in to uh, look at the songs he wrote with Elvis Costello because they had attempted to record together and then yeah. that sort of fell apart My Brave Face was one of them My Brave Face yeah. You One or Two and uh, I just know this because someone talked to me about it. That day is done. But a lot of them, I sort of made the decision that the tracks, like my, that day is done, for example, that the tracks and the vocal were so good that there was just no way you were going to redo them. My Brave Face, we redid. You One or Two, we redid. We, I think we took the intro from their version. But it, it was mostly based on the idea that Elvis had a idea that ultimately was a forward idea, but at that moment seemed like a backward idea, which is he very much wanted it to sound as 60s as possible. And this was like 1988, and Paul, and then Paul heard Elvis's new record, and Paul was thinking, so you can sound modern, but I have to sound old. So this isn't working out. You know, this is not, I don't, want to sound like I'm trying to sound like I did in the 60s just because you like it you know you didn't do it yourself so why should I <laughs> you know so they didn't have a falling out per se but that was the essence of the issue so you know I think Elvis had all, the manager really liked Crowded House which had just come out and was doing well which obviously had a beetle kind of feeling to it at times and Elvis, I would worked with him some, and he told Paul I was okay. So I just went over, and we just worked on those four songs. So, it, uh, yeah, it was... Was Paul pretty sure of what he wanted? Was he uh, was he pretty clear, uh, you know, uh, in arrangements and production ideas? He, he, uh, he was open. And... Uh, at the same, at the same time, he's just, he's just, he's incredible. At times, it was so incredible, like you couldn't even. For me, like uh, for example, when he plays the bass and he's playing the Hofner, yeah, there's a thing that for years there'd be bands and they'd all oh, play kind of a McCartney, you know, mm -hmm. do, 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 like all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. and and then he's in the room playing the bass, and it uh, like sometimes he'd be in the control room I, on my brave face. He, had this kind of really cool bass line yeah. and so he was in the control room playing it after we got the track and it kind of freaked me out because it it, it was uh, 
not just pop. It was almost like he was this deep blues player that mm. had all this energy. Like his attitude on the bass was just like it, it messed me up. And so he, he uh, you know, also simple stuff like he played kind of in a high register. So whenever he'd play a low note, it would sound like the best note you ever heard. It was all these things that you kind of heard on records and like but when you're confronted with it i mean that that's the beauty of my job is like you is seeing stuff and uh when, when it's right in your face it 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 freaks you out a little bit you know and he liked it and also he i think he was in the studio so much that if he was ever challenged like uh i remember on one song he was trying to redo the bass and it, what we had was good and he was just trying to redo it and it, and it was going nowhere and uh, I, so I finally just said well I think what we have is good you know and he said give me one more and then he just played something amazing mm. so and he came in the control room once and had this Stratocaster that was on the darkest sound and the engineer said oh I always wanted to use that sound he said roll the tape and then he would play something that in, in a way it it was like he liked the challenge. He liked to be challenged. Mm. But I didn't want to mess with him. <laughs> and I didn't want to say, well, why don't you try that hard all the time? You know? <laughs> but but it was... And there was mo one moment where he played with his band where where he was just singing and playing. It was, it, it was like seeing the Beatles or something. It was incredible. So, yeah. But, uh, you know, like I did a horn arrangement on that song, uh, That Day Is Done. And so I told him, I said, is it okay if I do a horn arrangement? You know, do you want me to show it to you before? He said, no, go, you know, go ahead and do it, you know. And I said, well, I know you like to be there all the time for everything is what I hear. And he says, well, if I'm not here, just do it. I'll tell you if I like it or not. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't over controlling at all. He was open. And, uh, but he knew what he, he knew what he wanted. You know, when you were cutting those basic tracks was... He wasn't playing bass then, was he? Or did, did... Yeah, so, sometimes he was, and mm -hmm. then sometimes... This was the 80s still, so it was more of a process, and you couldn't fix things as much. There, if, so he would sing and play bass a lot? Yeah, like uh, you wanted to... I don't want to get too deep in this, but the, the we were cutting that, and the drummer at the time, for whatever reason, it was difficult to just get a full take. And I, I don't want to go into it, but... There was a half hour in which he was singing with that full rasped voice, you know, and playing. And he was so good that, but the, the take never got through. And you couldn't, it wasn't the days where you go like, oh, okay, well, we'll just move this over here. Fine. Don't worry about it. You know, or we just fix this little bit. No, we're, we're good now, you know, but the moment came and went and we didn't get to track until his voice was shot. Mm. So, but I still got to see that half hour, and it was incredible. Mm -hmm. I was angry, but <laughs> but you know. That's what's great about working at home when you've got things dialed in already. You don't have to worry about not having it right when people come to sing and play. You know yeah. your studio. You you know what works. You're you're not yeah, spending but, time but in that burning case, them out. You know, if, 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 in that case, that would have been an argument for Pro Tools because we could have just taken the great vocal performance and bass performance and where other instruments were off, we could have like adjusted them a little bit and it would have been just fine, you know? But there's also this like feeling like if anybody was off a little bit, it was really bad and, you know, so the guy probably was not doing that badly, but the engineer was really unhappy whenever he heard anything kind of go off a little bit. It was, it was a, it was a different time than music, you know, yeah. let's put it that way. So, uh, there wasn't as many things where you would in that time there wasn't as many instances where you would keep something that was uh questionable mm -hmm. and decide it was charming mm -hmm. <laughs> are you happier now with the way things are uh except for the business part which, yeah which which makes yeah. me want to <laughs> yeah it make that part makes me want to stop does it uh it was just it's it's depressing and it's depressing for the artists and it's yeah you know, it's just there's no support, you know. Right, creative, creatively it's better, Much and it's better. to a smaller audience. 
I don't even care about the audience. I just care about people's Getting ability. Getting paid. Well, not, not even that. Just people's ability to make records and do it in a way that's not, that is somewhat supported. Like, you can do it modestly. That's fine. When you say no support, you mean from a record company? Yeah, there's no support from a record company. And, you know, certainly there's no government support. Or, you know, it, it's gotten country. down to the place where, you know, somebody can call me and, and they can want to do a record. Well, it was happened not for a while, but of $3,000. It's like, well, my engineer has three kids, so <laughs> what? And you want musicians, so yeah, you know, I that's a lot of money to you, I, but that's it doesn't not, even pay the rent for the day you'll be in the studio. Yeah, even if I'm free, you know, yeah, you, yeah. So, <laughs> I, I get it. Although kids, they have a different mindset of expectations. Like, coming from a time where we had that, yeah. it feels like it's diminished, but. Kids just make make music, put it on SoundCloud. Make music, put it on SoundCloud, yeah. and and that's the thing. Yeah, but the, the there's no all the stuff I learned from other musicians and other producers and being in studios, like the mentoring system, which I'm in, I'm interested in trying to whatever I've learned when I work with someone to try to direct as much as I can because it's like the you can pass some stuff on, like just some ideas about music. People just do it themselves, and I can hear it in the music. I, I can hear the limitations of their possibilities and where they and where they are now. And it it's kind of that part is kind of depressing. What's great is if I'm working with artists, I can do you can do anything. There's no A and R guy asking for this kind of snare drum sound or like. There's nothing you you can approach music any way you want which is wonderful I, it's that ma might outweigh the other it's just that i feel s so badly for the younger artists and and what they have to try to do you know just because it's not like it's easy to go on the road it's not like to just build up a thing uh the, the only places where it seems like you can really build something up it, it's frankly the most obnoxious way which is a lot of social media i mean it, it's really important. I understand it, but it's not why musicians used to get into things to like have to post every day of whether the sun is out or, mm -hmm. you know, like act like everyone's your best friend or, you know, there's great things about it. You, you know, this podcast is great to have things, but just that pressure to try to build mm -hmm. this thing by being so available. There's no mystery in it. M musicians used to be like cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It wasn't all out there. If now we NBA busy. guys are cool. You know, like, <laughs> at yeah. the same time, I see some people who are really great at that part and the marketing, but they haven't put a lot into their artistry. They haven't spent years to become great writers. And yeah, but they would argue, that, hey, that's more important. I think they're and, wrong. I would well, argue no, that. I, I no, know, I, but, but, I know but, they would, of but, course. But then they would say, yeah. Especially if it's working. And they yeah, well, they say, look, it's working for me. I can play you 10 great artists that aren't getting anywhere. So Right. No, so who's right, who's wrong, you know? Right. So this is just the way it is. So it's part of the skill yeah. now. Ultimately, you can do both. Like, Louise is great with social media and writes great songs. I mean, you can Thank do you. both. Well, you have but to, it takes years to develop but you have into to, that kind of you song. You have to right? find a way, I'm sure you struggle with it, you have to find a way that's graceful to yourself. Yeah. Because you don't seem to me like the kind of person that wakes up and say, can we speak about me right now? <laughs> you know, like how I'm feeling and it, it, you know what I mean it's it's like I a, usually wake up in the morning and I'm <laughs> on social media <laughs> trying to stop that trying to actually get into the day but it, yeah I think really what I've learned is it, it it does it does take a tribe it it's really important to have community and I think the whole concept of having bands and partners where that you work with where one person's strength might be you know, booking the van and getting the gig or doing the social media. And yeah. y y you have to divvy up the Responsibility. the responsibilities because no one person can handle all of it. And there's been times when I was doing all my own social media, and I do do a lot of my own stuff, um, where I just feel so frazzled and I just go, who am I? Yeah. You know, why... Why am I so? Why have I put so much energy into things that are not nourishing? That's right. 
And but you have some to take it care. Is nursing, I think, but I that's all that's what they have. That's their interest. You have to have a center because if you if it's yeah. all extending outwards and you don't have a center, you just burn out. You yeah, know? I, I, I'm just completely unable. I, I mean, yeah. you no, know, I just be. Uh, I'm more reclusive naturally, and because I'm not an artist, you know, I don't go and sing in front of people and stuff. I I live more out here, you know. That, that I'm a behind the scenes person, so it's different. But there's some of my friends have the same job as me and do much better because they're much more uh, networking style and all that. And I, I just don't I don't have it in me, and I, I, you just sort of come to terms with who you are and, mm -hmm. and what you do, you know. Mm -hmm. But you have to find a way to do it, like I say, that's graceful to you so that, okay, if you spend an hour in the morning, all right. There's a lot of other hours in the day. As long as you balance it so that you can have time to be creative and, and like feel, just feel good about stuff. But if you are spending 12 hours a day manically on social media, and you might even do better for yourself that way, but that's just not the, a way to live, right? It's, it's, no, it's, and, and you know, to me, there's a certain etiquette like we all know famous people and you're out and about and there's always a moment of oh wow if i could get a selfie with this person yeah. and, and then i always choose the humanity in the situation over the the reach you know yeah. it's like the minute you take a selfie with this person you know they're going to perceive you a different way from that moment yeah. going forward and that's not worth it to yeah. me i, I want to be i want to be a pe respected peer and and not one of those people saying, "Hey, can I take a selfie with you?" Yeah, or deeper, who are you to yourself, right? So yeah, am I yeah. the kind of person that's like, you know, the the town I was born in, this town called Petaluma, California. There, there was this guy that did a, a column every day. He was just drunk. He'd like wander the streets at three in the morning. But he would go to the San Francisco uh, airport, and whenever a celebrity would come off the plane. He'd have a photographer with him. He'd run up to the guy and put his arm around him. And that's what he became most famous for. He had his picture taken with everybody. But they'd be looking at him like, right. you know. But you don't want to be that. Yeah, like, yeah it, it, yeah, it really, but, you have to search yourself for what's right. My yeah. first boss at, at the National Academy of Songwriters was that way. And he did it with Randy Newman. I took the picture. Quick, take the picture. Who the did picture that? was Randy going like that. The next day it was framed already on the wall. Who did that? It was uh, my boss. Oh, right. We, we you don't see, yeah. But but at the same time, when I first went in his office, and I was pretty new in Hollywood, and, wow, he has this picture with Stephen Bishop. Any of those, like, yeah. wow, those are serious guys. Yeah. It, did actually quite it doesn't matter if it worked. It's exposed. I owe eventually. my niece because I was sitting next to Aretha Franklin, and there was no way in the world I would ever pick up a phone and take a selfie yeah. with Aretha. I just wouldn't. Yeah. But she was across the table, saw oh, us talking, and she just lifted her phone and got this one picture, which I am so grateful. That's a cool photo. Yeah, but see, that's well, a good. See, but that's the way life should be. <laughs> it's Aretha, you know. Well, well, no, no, well that was my my niece getting having yes. my back. But well, yeah, my, but your niece loving you and right. saying, "Hey, I want to do something nice for my aunt." Is so it's it's it it removes you, and it allows someone to do something nice for you. It Aretha's not like. Make made uncomfortable, like oh here. But I was willing to walk away from that situation yeah, with no documentation. Yeah. That was a thing you have to really choose in your heart what's the priority, what's your what's important to you. You know, so those those are moments where you find out who you are. You know, yeah. and then you go, oh damn, I wish I got one. <laughs> you know, whatever it is. No, but uh, to me, like the memory of it, I never had pictures. I saw a your picture Paul McCartney. of. McCartney stories are amazing you well, don't have pictures I, 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 got some, with them. <laughs> I never had a I saw a picture of me with him that in some booklet that they released yeah. for something but I don't have any pictures of me with him but I like the memory of it more than I like the looking at the pictures and you have the work too you have the, the record well yeah and, and the mystery of it or whatever just the, the memory of things is much more powerful than the than that tactile like your, thing. Your dad used to say that. Take a picture with your eyes, right? Right, that that's what my... And he said that way before Yeah, if you're on vacation. Yeah, he probably hated home movies and stuff, <laughs> right? Or did he well, thankfully, say? there's a few of them that have turned up, but um, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know if he felt that way about the Super 8 cameras, but he used to say that in the 60s, you know, with little Kodak cameras, he'd say, take pictures with your eyes, you know? It's really about being the moment and really absorb where you are. It's, it's quality of life. Yeah. You know? And and the problem with it, and I suffer from it too, because, for example, 
since we have our president, I'm constantly checking my phone on New York Times to see if he's thrown out yet. Yeah, me too. So, obsessive. So, I used to just sit someplace and look out into space, but as soon as you get that dopamine rush from constantly checking your phone to see if this happened or that, it 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 uh, that goes away. And I swear at some point I'm going to just tell everyone I'm only available in the morning. That's it. I'm checking my messages once a day in the morning. I'm not going to be in touch with anybody and just stop. Just throw, you know, basically put it away or put it in a room somewhere. Because I, I don't like the that? quality of life. I don't, I don't enjoy it as much. I, I was much happier with it. I was much happier in a world without that than, I, than a world with it. Yeah. Even though... Musically, it's helped me enormously. I've been able to do stuff I never would be able to do. Even with that, I still would have preferred having to find the musicians and like having, you have to go in the studio, all that stuff. is It's just more social, more soulful. Like, yeah. You know. you know, in our remaining time, we could talk to you forever, yeah. but we won't. But I wanted to just ask you about a few uh, artists that we haven't spoken about. And You did two, two albums with Peter Case. Right. His first album for Geffen, the Peter Case. And yeah, I just six worked on a few love. songs. Just a few songs. Yeah. What, what was that? Was that a good experience? Yeah, it was good. I, I don't think either of the things that I did with him stood up as his finest work. I, I, I think that it was a little bit of a man out of time, naturally, with the aesthetic of the time. Like, I, like uh, T-Bone did most of that first Peter Case record. I worked on a few songs. I, at the end, I produced a few songs. And at the time, I think it was like New York Times best album, or yeah, but, but it doesn't I really it, do, it it doesn't. If you listen to his later work, it's much more connected. Hmm. Uh, it, it the the aesthetic of that time, even though they were trying some unusual things. Mm -hmm. In the case of the record after, we were just going for like a scrappy or trying to get a band, but it didn't really sound like a band, and so it just. I think he just did. Better later, yeah. you know, and, and yes, better earlier. So he's still writing amazing songs. Yeah, right? and, yeah. I, and I always liked him a lot. Yeah. But I just, you know, as a producer, you wish you were there for the guys crowning work. I think the Plimsolls were were better, and then I think his later stuff after out of the eighties and all mm -hmm. that, early nineties, whatever. He it got more and more serious. You know, and he so. also worked on a, a, another album I love, Stan Ridgeway's uh, "The Big Heat." Right, that's the, a great record. Yeah. The, I think I just worked on one or two songs on that. I don't even remember. I think, didn't it, wasn't there another producer that was the primary producer of it? I wasn't sure. You know, when I look at all your credits, it just yeah. lists the album. It doesn't say... Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I only maybe did one song. I did a song with him for a movie one time. Called The song was called Bing Can't Walk. It, I just liked him a lot, but it was all that kind of new wavy sort of stuff. Yeah. I don't think any of those stand as my personal crowning achievements as a producer, but it was all, I always did my best, you know. They did many albums with Elvis Costello, right? Yeah, as a musician and as a producer, both. So, uh, so something like Blood and Chocolate, T-Bone was producing? And you no, were, Blood no, and Chocolate was Nick yours. Lowe. Oh, I see. And that was really, a really great album. I, with Elvis, the ones I produced was Mighty Like a Rose, which was kind of, Maybe a bit over the top, but people seem to like it. Now. I, like, I like that record. And then um, the, another one called Brutal Youth, which I, I thought was better, just in terms of the work I did. Um, and I just in general, I, I kind of prefer that. And then I played on uh, like King of America. King know? of America. And then the, the other one that, that uh, T Bone did, the one that had Veronica on it. Stuff. Right. Yeah. But, uh, so I played on. Veronica, yeah, I played on about four or five songs on that. So I knew him for quite a while. Elvis? Yeah. What's it like to work with him? Well, he, when, at least at that time, when you worked with Elvis, you weren't really the producer. You were, you helped out. He led the charge. He was always completely calling things, making decisions. To, you know, you, he was open to you bringing ideas to it. But he was definitely the this kind of force of nature guy that would just like bull through things. I remember on <laughs> there's this one song called "Other Side of Summer" on the Mighty Like a Rose record, and at one point he had 
three different vocal lines going, all with different words. And and I, I just, I remember saying to him, I said, I can't hear anything. I I can't make out anything. Because I think there's even a rule about that, that you, if you have different words and different melodies, two is the maximum you can have, like an opera or something. They, if you're careful, you can have a duet where they're singing different things at each other. Uh, but he said, really? I, I hear it completely clearly. <laughs> Three simultaneous. Simultaneous vocal lines. Some were back up, but all different words. And was there, were there level changes in them, the way he heard them presented, or were they all the same level? Were they all well, no, vocals? some were background parts, but still, yeah. I think there was a lead and then two separate kind of background parts, but all with different words, all going on at the same time. So his his brain was just like on fire. <laughs> you know, he could hear everything. So, yeah, that would be the kind of thing I would say. It's like, I can't. And then the engineer was like, yeah, you can't make out of anything. This is, and he said, really? That sounds clear to me, you know, that. So he was, that's who he was. He's a force of nature. Hmm. Then you worked on Richard Thompson's Mirror Blue. Mirror Blue, and uh, I think I did five records with Richard. And, uh, Mirror Blue, the, the one before it was was the one that was kind of the most successful that had been, uh, Rumor and Sigh was the one that people seemed to like. The That's a great record. Uh, that had that uh, Vincent Black Lightning and stuff. And that kind of, that was his, at the time, his best-selling record. And then Mirror Blue, he tried to get kind of more experimental. And, and it was kind of hated at the time. I think later people started liking it, but it was not well-received. <laughs> It was seen as like, well, why are you doing that with Richard? Why are you going down this kind of stranger route with him? And, I didn't know that. I like yeah. that album a lot. Yeah, I, I liked it too, you know. But he, it, he has, as you know, is not only you know a great songwriter, but such an amazing guitarist. Oh, yeah. yeah he, he's incredible. A wonderful guy. Yeah. And, uh, Would he do those solos live? Always. Live, yeah? Yeah, all the, the, every record would have some, at least one song where he would just go off and just play and it was always live and if just, I if he ever made a mistake or a glitch or anything like that I, if I'd said well is that okay he said well it's a guitar solo <laughs> so and, and distinctive he does as you know he doesn't use bluesy notes he doesn't do the typical rock guitar things ever he has his complete own style pretty much. yeah it's a it's a hybrid of of a I, I, it was kind of a Celtic thing on <laughs> one hand and it's also got sort of this sort of jazz, like a kind of dissonant jazz element in it and and like a 50s rock element to it. Hmm. And so it's like this hybrid that he just became his and it was really edgy and intense and and uh, yeah, he, he, he's one of a kind, a lovely guy too. I, those are, I did five records with him, but it, it never felt like it because his records always were, at least for the time, they were very quick. It was three or four weeks. And every other record seemed to take months, you know, at least three months. So it three didn't feel like five records. Pardon? You did them in just a few weeks, his records? Yeah, they, wow. three or four weeks. So we record the tracks, and then we usually go to England and record folk instruments over the top and, and just mix it. It was just, it, it was, they were quick. And just one more artist I wanted to ask you about, uh, Vonda Shepard, I gotta say, right. no, I've loved Vonda right. for years. She's, yeah. she's been great for so long, and the, I remember when she did that Ricky Lee Jones tour, and she was kind of a character in Ricky Lee Jones. Is, yeah, she told me about that. I never saw that. Yeah. yeah, and she sang with Jackson, and yeah, she's she's great. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I really enjoy working with her. I mean, at this point, if we work together, it's nice because, you know, I I know what she wants to do. So if she's singing and she's doing a vocal comp, I just leave. You know, I just I know where she wants to really step in, and then where she wants to step back a little. So it, it's it's nice, and and there obviously there's uh, it's nice because there's it's not like either one of our careers is dependent on the other. So you know, if the record business was still great and she had big budgets, I would probably encourage her all oh, like maybe work with this guy or try different, you know. But it's just, it's not based on, I think that's where 
those kinds of records can be problematic is when, say, the husband is the producer or, say, the wife is the producer, whatever it might be. And, uh, but there's too much at stake. And it's too important to the producer that the artists succeed. or And so that's, it involves the relationship. It, I, I yeah. understand what you're saying. Yeah, it can, yeah. It can get... I was married to a producer. So oh, really? Yeah. It gets... It gets unclear because you feel, you know, because it's your spouse that things should be pr prioritized right. as an artist. Well, it also depends. Is he at the high point of his career at that moment? If you're at the high point of your career and he's just starting, it all the dynamic well, is always shifting. shifting. It's always shifting. And sometimes <clears throat> it isn't even the high point. Sometimes you just have to do what you have to do to move forward. Yeah. And that has, has to be the priority, you yeah. know. You know, and if you're raising a child as you are, yeah, always the child becomes the rock star in the family. Oh, yeah. that comes you're first. a good parent. It should be that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we share two boys. Yeah, and uh, well, how old are they now? One of them's 19, um, and his and his brother's 16, and they're yeah. both really musical. You just have to be really careful, and just make sure that it's nice from the beginning to end, like, like that aspirations and all that you, you, you just have to uh, remember whose record it is and and just try to see what you have how you can do it where the person's happy and and you know put the effort in but not it can't be loaded if mm -hmm. it's loaded it it's gonna go badly what is lo what do you mean by loaded well one one thing about loaded say if you're the artist and your husband's a producer, you don't like something, but the husband loves it. You have to be able to say, I don't like that. And he has to be able to say, well, I like it, but that's okay. Let's do something else. It, it's not, it can never get, well, basically with anybody, as far as I'm concerned, in the studio. Well, you I have a never, mother I've worked with. So it's what? sometimes I have a mother that I've worked with. Yeah. So sometimes it's like, I'm wearing the daughter hat right now. Yeah. Or... I want to. I'm wearing producer, producer hat, hat right yeah. now, and so you know when you set off the conversation, which way you're approaching the conversation. Yeah, well, if you're the producer, you, in my mind, you, you should be the accommodating one. You should not be the egocentric one. It could be a question. Yeah. It could be producer hat. Which song do you want to go with? Which mix do you want to go right. with? Yeah. Yeah, but you don't. You're not now trying to define, redefine your relationship with your mother, like saying I'm in control now. I'm producing you. You know. So oh, never. You, you know what I'm saying. So, but I, I see these situations where they have been loaded, and I've seen the situations where uh, a few, like you say, oftentimes producers tend to be have been historically more male than female, and their wife might be an artist, but where they their aspirations for it. Are, are that they want to get established as a producer. They want to be noticed on the basis of this record. I see what you mean by loaded now. Yeah, yeah that, that's a lot there, of... There's all this stuff I've seen over the years, and, and it's uh, that's where it just, you know, okay, this is going to fail, this is going to fail, that's just no way. You know? Yeah, Well, to, to wrap it up, you know, it's really interesting what you're talking about the, the, the blessings and the curses of the modern technology, and yeah. the business is mostly a curse, it seems, but... Are you optimistic about the, the future of uh, music and the popular music and songwriting in general? It, it's not the most optimistic moment because uh, we're in an era where the most popular music has kind of abandoned harmony for the most part and to some degree melody. Uh, however, music is cyclical. If, I'm, if I was to be uh, optimistic, I would see that there's some incredible young musicians and people young that are working and people with talent. Uh, and I just hope that the this whole streaming stuff is at a place where it will at least start to support the idea of records getting made. Uh, unfortunately, a lot I you, know, you hear about Spotify's and these people, they're not exactly leaning that way. It's more like how to maximize profits in strange ways and, mm -hmm. you know, well, that's being fought very hard right now with Spotify and Google. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I just have never understood that. Why are songwriters so really treated like the janitors of when 
music is running everything. It's in, you know the restaurants, the car commercials, everywhere we go. It's it's yeah. the it's the energy and spiciness and variety of life that is everywhere that we need. Without it, everything would just be bland consumerism. And we're I I guess because there's just so many songwriters. Yeah, Thirty thousand songs a month they put out. Yeah. So to them, it's cheap. It's like. Anybody will do anything to get noticed. So why should we even care? Like I, I had this friend of mine who, that works in France and he was trying to get them. He was saying like, look, if you have a jazz artist and he has a small audience, but they listen every day to his record, shouldn't those plays? And the person pays $10 a month and they listen to 20 songs a month. Shouldn't that be worth more than the ten dollars a month a kid would pay, and he listens to three thousand twenty seconds of hip hop songs? Shouldn't the ten plays be worth more than the two thousand plays or whatever mm-hmm. a million plays? Like, shouldn't you? Good point. And, and they're like, no. They're, well, to them, it's like, well, that's another layer of accounting. So <laughs> why would we want to do that? Yeah. We just keep it simple. It's just like you get a play. This is what you get. Yeah. So it's they're, they're kind of evil. They're they're kind of almost worse than labels used to be. That yeah. It used to be, you know, get played on radio. You get paid for every performance. You still get played, you know, on the internet. It's, you're still hearing the song, but it's not. It's we not supposedly you get paid, but it's so Nothing. incrementally small. It's, we're still yeah. hearing the song, right? Yeah. I, mean, I, don't, I don't. You know, we we can all because you know, we're older. We you can sit around and complain about stuff. Yeah. But. You know, on the other hand, if if you're going to be truthful, the whole singer songwriter thing that may have started, say, late '50s, '60s till now, it's kind of worn itself out in some way. So it is time for new ways of doing things, mm-hmm. new ways of presenting it. Like it's good if you're established and you have the people that love you. That you know, Fleetwood Mac can go play and the people go see him and love it. But if you know, you want the younger artists, you want it to be not all you want it to be something exciting like find some kind of hybrid of things or find some way of doing it yeah i i I think it's becoming back to what it was when it started which is a cottage industry people going and playing for their friends and the friends getting to be a larger crowd and a bigger party and selling something a t-shirt that represents the the brand of the band and I think that's really the only thing that's measurable anymore because with streaming, it's really an advertisement for yeah. the band that you could go see down at the local pub. Yeah. But it's just, it, it, it's depressing because there's so much. So it's like, it, it makes it where like an average listener that maybe loves music, like what, I've talked to people that are like, how do you even find anything yeah, you might like? it's a lot of music. Yeah, so how do you... Yeah. I mean, you want to, to listen that. through 20 crappy things right. before you find one thing Well, that's you like. one thing that Spotify is actually good at, because if you like something, it sends you down a rabbit hole of similar-sounding things. Yeah, and who there's, decides it? Yeah, those and are always good suggestions. No, right? they're terrible. As an artist, I can say that it's... I've wanted to pull yeah. my hair out with when they say similar-sounding artists, but well, I have found great things that way. It's I interesting know. to me that sometimes a song will come by, like Adele's song, Hello, that's a traditional song with a great melody... People love it. They'd love to hear a great song still, you know? Well, the yeah, melody. But, they, but it's got to get to them. And she right. was like a, one of the last products of a big big label promotion and all that. Yeah. So if, if that song just came out as one of the 20,000 that came out next month, it, it wouldn't have a chance. True. It, yeah. it just wouldn't. It wouldn't. It, no one would ever hear it. It, it. Someone would have to pick it up for a commercial. I like guess it, it would somehow have to reach sure. the, a person that could actually do something. Right. But it does show that melodies still matter, that that kind of song craft and art matters. And well, it religion. matters to certain people. You don't think, people do you think melodies that, will not have, that always well, matter? Well, there's some not? melodies. My son listens to hip-hop. You know, I, yeah. I, you know, there's some melodies in there. there. There's some catchy things. We've been going down the hip-hop, hip-hop rabbit hole. We Chuck D yesterday, actually. In yeah. yeah. And, and it, 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 there is, there's a lot of art in the writing and the lyrics and the percussion of the lyrics and the, yeah. the message and the content. You know, I, I love that there's content that's talking about the world and things 
But really I, I happening? Remember, uh, I'm sorry. No. Randy, Randy Newman said, you know, they started with just rap, and then they realized, put a chorus in there. You know, it really helps if you have a, you know, yeah. a melody chorus. Yeah. Really, you know, people do, I, I think, want melody. Yeah. No, they, there's, they love it when they get it. There's music. It's, it's just, it's, it's sort of diffuse now, yeah. and it's not, uh, the, the things that are most missing to me it comes from just that people just doing things in their bedroom. You know, like it, it used to be like, Okay, if you want to be a singer in the forties, like you'd have to go to the nightclub, you'd have to be able to get up on stage, right. and you'd have to impress the audience. If yeah. you were bad, you're thrown off, and then you come back the next time and try. You, you had to like actually do something and be good. Yes. You know, that's a big difference. Anyone yeah. can make a CD. Yeah, and so generally, someone who made an album, there was a good reason that they were making that record. Yeah, there was enough yeah. of an endorsement. Yeah. Still, there was like a some kind of thing. It, and also mentorship, which is a big thing. Like, you learn from this guy, you learn from that guy. Mm -hmm. But that, like, young artists, they don't even know what a producer could possibly do. They don't even understand what it is. Yeah. I've, I've talked to people that don't say, so, well, what, what, what would you actually do? Right. Well, how about if somebody worked with you on it and it could be a lot better or, mm -hmm. or, or helped, helped you get better at music or, like, you think you're or pointed out things that you need to work on, or, like, you know, put you in a situation where maybe it, and they would, their reaction would be, well, yeah, maybe, but what's the difference? You, like, what, what would be the difference? There's like, really beautiful. no way for people to learn that unless you happen to grow up somewhere where you're sitting around with aunts and uncles who, you know, like were you. In the, <laughs> yeah, where they're talking about studio days, but you need to get it from somewhere, and, yeah. and, key for me is when kids are interested in what came before because there's so much to learn from it you know yeah. when, and and you meet people who know all these records that were made 40 years before they were ever they born they can find them like that not like they, we, we couldn't do that just you know immediately access an old yeah record. well that's what i like that's yeah, also there's what i like of, about that stuff because i yeah. can go back and hear stuff that i haven't yeah. heard and and that's a great thing a, and and then there, there's kids who just don't care they're just like I'm doing my own thing. I don't care what came before. I don't need to know. There's always been that. Yeah. But the ones that are really, really good don't feel that way. Yeah, there's a... there's a The, the, the ones that feel that way, it's usually out of fear or it's like trying to find their feet a little bit first before they open themselves up to something. But Yeah. And, uh, the carrying to, forward of the... Yeah, and trying to get better, like seeing how, how good yeah. you can be. Like, why else would you want to do it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking this time. Oh yeah, it was yeah. Great to talk to you. Yeah, we could sit here forever. Yeah, I'm happy. very happy to meet you, and I'm very happy to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's great. I'm glad you're still going. I'm glad oh. you're still making records. You should not let it go. Oh, thank you. You too. Every day is a chance for 